Good evening and welcome to the regular meeting of the Trumbull Board of Education, Tuesday, September 8th, 2020 at 7 p.m. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, correspondent, Mrs. Uh, we've received uh, 29 emails since the last board meeting. Jess DeBono, Gisetta Kiplick, Steve, Stephanie Bergamo, Lindsay Richard, Colette and Mike DuBas, and Christopher DeCruz were very upset and felt it was totally unacceptable to hear that we didn't, we had a shortage of teachers, and they asked that we keep parents every week in, in our in communications. Beth Cooley's and family and Karen DeRose uh, were upset that the math team at Trumbull High might be cut and they've asked us and the principal to reconsider. Matt Songer and Melissa Chamberlain and Jane McIntyre, Rob Harry, Jess Henry, Douglas and Gatino DeLeo and Lauren Hognick were very uh, upset with the new protocols for walkers at Jane Ryan. Dana Miser, Amy Tudus, Jennifer Laddead, Christopher DeCruz, Allison Valance, and Elaine Durbano sent us a list of questions and issues and offered their suggestions on how to run and support things. Angela McDermott, Patricia Roth, Andrew and Catherine McDonald asked us to try to be more creative and think out of the box as we return children to school for in-school education. They feel that all children need in-person learning, especially special ed students. Pamela Smith said even with the opening of school today, she felt there were four areas of concerns and unanswered questions uh, she listed them as financial impact on families, distant learning for young children, communications or lack of, and future learning plan. Michael Redgrave is requesting that he be able to start practice tomorrow night at 5.30 to 8 p.m. at the Hillcrest Pool for Trumbull Pichis. Now, I did receive at four o'clock today, and we usually don't take uh, notices, but both of these emails were very positive and about our opening, so I felt the board and the public should hear them. Lisa Newland, and this is just a, an excerpt, said, congratulations on a successful opening for this complicated school year. I would just ask going forward that we keep up with our transparent communications. Thank you to all of Trumbull PS for their great first day. And Jonathan Disney said when his girls came home today, he asked them before they ran out to play, how was school? And they said, safe, supported, and engaged. Those are our emails today. Thank you very much. Okay, our next is public comment. Our first speaker is Michael Barker. Thank you, Madam Chairman, uh, members of the Board of Education, uh, Michael Barker, 26 George Street. While I'm an elected member of the Board of Finance, today I'm speaking uh, as a concerned parent of a Jane Ryan kindergartner. My wife and I opted our son out of in-person learning because our, our reading of the public health science and our privilege that we were able to adjust our schedules to accommodate his learning. We have been anxious but hopeful. However, we are now past the full, first full day of school and my wife and I do not have a schedule for our son's education, nor any clear idea of how instruction will be conducted for temporary remote students going forward. I took a half day off this morning because all we knew about the first day of school was that my son needed to appear on Google Meet at 8.50 a.m., that he had gym at 2 p.m., and that my wife had to go to work in New Haven. After a 10-minute meeting at 8.50 a.m., the teacher logged off leaving the six temporary remote kindergarten households to ask reasonably, what are we supposed to do now until 2 p.m.? This despite dozens of emails from the superintendent, assistant superintendent, Jane Ryan principal, 
and my child's teacher, there has been a lot of correspondence and very little actual communication. Listen, I know this is hard. I know it's unprecedented. But if Trumbull Public Schools can't provide the 9% of elementary students who have opted into temporary remote learning with even a basic schedule for their day, then TPS has failed those students and their parents. If providing an option for temporary remote learning really means that the parents of these kids have committed to full-time temporary homeschooling, then TPS needs to say so. If it is truly an option, then the full option, including basic schedules and orientation must be provided. The bare minimum should be knowing when he has to turn his webcam on more than a day in advance. This has been a very rough start for our temporary remote kids. You have the power to fix it. The fix is so simple. Communicate with us. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Denise Fiola. Hello, Denise Fiella, 5 Wynn Hall Lane. Um, I'm just taking this opportunity on behalf of myself, as well as many others that work in central office. I wanted to take this time to thank Mr. Iasagna for the wonderful job he has done as acting superintendent since January. As an employee, as well as a member of the community, I have seen the many challenges we have all the work behind the scenes. His leadership, knowledge of the district, and strong experience have been Trumbull's asset during a time of many difficulties. Ralph, I wish you well, and thank you for everything you have done. All the best. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Denise. Okay. Our next is superintendent report. It's hard to follow that, but uh, thank you, Ms. Pippinelli. But uh, certainly two things. One, Mr. Barker, we will follow through on that and we're going to respond to any um, uh, discussions uh, with regards to um, comments from the public. We will follow through, Jonathan, tonight, tomorrow with regard to the temporary remote learning. Uh, Denise, uh, <laughs> I'm overwhelmed by that. I appreciate that. It's been a pleasure working with you and Lauren and uh, Everybody here in town, and uh, uh, when I came on board, um, there were a lot of challenges, but you know what? I am so glad I took this position. Uh, everyone's been cooperative, supportive, hardworking, and uh, uh, it's a great way to end your career. And uh, thank you for being you and for doing such an outstanding job with Lauren. I really appreciate that. Uh, as far as our report tonight, uh, at the beginning of each school year, uh, Trumbull High School selects two individuals to represent students in a myriad of uh, events that happen in the district, particularly at Trumbull High School. Uh, I am pleased to announce that Jack Allen and Gabriella Miandi have been chosen and uh, in meeting with them, I believe they will be a true asset to this board. Both have joined us uh, uh, tonight on Zoom and uh, maybe we can have them introduce themselves. Um, Gabriella, would you like to say a few words? Is Gabriella be on here? If not, then Jackie. I see her. Now I see her name. Gabby. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes now we can, hear Gabriella. Hi, my name is Gabby Biondi, and I'm a senior at Trumbull High, and I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Well, welcome. Okay. We will see you soon, hopefully. Okay, yes. what's Jack Allen? Is Jack Allen on? Well, we welcome Jack Allen also and hopefully meet you soon. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, secondly, uh, Betty Simcoe, our uh, food service director, conveyed to me today, and this is a very important. Uh, modification that the state of Connecticut has approved getting free breakfast and lunches to any, to any student uh, in China public schools. Okay. This program entitled SSO, uh, Seamless Summer Option, was approved and received by food services late Friday night. This is a significant change from previous years and is projected that the monies to cover food costs from Fort coming from the state of Connecticut. And um, third, as you probably have heard, 
by now, the CIAC has ruled that football will not, will not be played in the fall season um, in volleyball. However, will go on, but players must wear masks during uh, play. It was a very difficult decision between the CIAC and the Department of Health. Um, and any further modifications will certainly be shared with the board and the public. I'm gonna switch, yeah, turn yours off. We're changing mics. How's that better? Much better. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, as you can see in the far reaches of this room, social distancing, uh, we welcome back Al Cameron as our inner business manager. And he will be meeting and transitionalizing with Paul Hendrickson, our newly hired business administrator. Um, Paul will be joining us on September 17th, and he and Al will get together and making sure that we have a seamless transition. Al, when I walked in today and I saw you walking in smiling, and uh, it's really uh, uh, great to see you. Al and I, for those who don't know, just by chance worked together in Brookfield, and uh, it was a, a great experience for me, and uh, this has been too. And uh, he's done a phenomenal job, and we'll hand the reins over to Paul sometime next week or week after. We'll decide that. But again, welcome back. Thank you, Ralph. <laughs> Thanks for the kind words. I want to convey to the public that uh, Mrs. Donna Seidel, the new principal at Jane Ryan Elementary School, will be leaving us on September 16th. Donna did an exceptional job in covering from Mary Ellen Bolton. Um, though she was scheduled to leave on June 30th, uh, she extended her stay to help the district in the school, and it was very, very much appreciated. Uh, Marty and Dr. Semmel is forming an interview committee and hopefully can choose a replacement sooner rather than later. If, however, that is not possible, Pat Clell, former principal of Middlebrook Elementary School, has 15 plus years of uh, service and experience in that position will assume the role to a new principal assignment. Uh, next, although we have notified the schools involved and placed the information on our website, and I want to emphasize, we did place a lot of information we pointed out to you in the past on our website instead of e-blasting all everything. Um, I believe that the community, uh, the board is already aware, but the community should be aware that on Thursday, September 3rd, a staff member at the uh, Tech Act tested positive, tested positive for COVID-19, excuse me. This person was in close contact with the other staff members, but never had contact with students. According to protocols and confirmed with Health Director Lisa Dongo, all these staff members cannot return to school until they meet the established return to work criteria, which certainly includes a 14-day quarantine and a COVID-19 test. You should also know that related to this, that the facilities department thoroughly sanitized the rooms at Tech Act in a small section at Middlebrook on Thursday evening and Friday that were occupied by these affected employees. We will continue to monitor this situation very closely. Thank you. Okay. Okay, next is uh, the board chairman report. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Marie and Scott and Tim they, and they have gone into the schools before the first day of school just to check on school readiness. And they checked for signage, cleaning products, uh, sanitizers, and cameras in rooms. So we hit most of the schools. I, I also went and we hit as many schools as we could during that week. And we spoke to the custodians that were there or the principals. So that was before. So we were happy. We saw some things weren't there and we asked and to be sure that they were there when the students entered and they assured us that they would be. Um, I'm sure today I went to uh, Trumbull High School, I went to Hillcrest and uh, they both looked good. We had a little traffic issue, but that's something normal for Trumbull High, about 25 minutes of traffic I saw, but everything looked well as they came in, the buses were good, kids came off the buses, everybody had their masks on entering the school, so it looked good to me at Hillcrest and at the high school. 
And I went over to AgriScience, and I think kids were coming from the high school going, walking over to AgScience and going into their classroom. So it seems like it went well. And I know that this morning, Petiti and uh, Marie Petiti and Jackie Marceau went over to Madison and Frenchtown, and Mr. Ward went over to Booth Hill. So everyone checked in to different schools, and thank you all for doing that. Lucinda, we, we went to Tashua, and by the time we got to Frenchtown, they were already in school. So we went to Tashua and uh, Ma Madison. Okay. Okay, and now I'd like to say a few words about uh, Mr. Isaga. Ralph, when you were asked to return to Trumbull Public Schools as an interim superintendent, you responded with a positive and energetic outlook. As you knew when you left it, it was a solid and well-functioning system. Never anticipating the level of distress you were about to encounter, you came on board to a very difficult situation. Your wealth of experience and skills were able to coordinate and direct the district as you became familiar with the issues at hand. A mid-year superintendent change, administrative res resignations, retirements, and positions were filled. A 1.2 to a $2 million deficit turned around to $132,000 balance at the year's end. A town audit, a difficult budget process, the State Department of Education and the governor's ever-changing guidelines and protocols, federal mandates, revised approaches to learning, classroom conversions, transportation issues, food service modifications, technology accommodation, graduation concerns, and special ed ma mandates, to name a few. You took up tasks with tenacity, assertiveness, knowledge, and expertise. You never faltered. Your leadership and keen sense of purpose helped us to move forward. You persevered through challenging times to focus on what needed to be accomplished. You did so with the utmost of professionalism. You were the right person at the right time to navigate through this. You were here in nine months. Usually in that length of time, a blessed event occurs. For you, it will be a well-deserved respite from the chaos of a pandemic and its obstacles. On behalf of the Board of Education, I thank you for your effort, work ethic, patience, and steadfast commitment to our district. We sincerely appreciate all you have contributed. Enjoy yet another new beginning. Godspeed. Okay, I was asked. Can I just, can I just say that I really appreciate that. Uh, I was humbled by it. And um, there was never a question in my mind on any of the days that I spent since uh, January 7th that uh, I loved coming to work. I loved working with the people I do, and particularly in this building, the teachers, the administrators, secretaries, everybody, certified, non-certified, were phenomenal in the, uh, working with me and cooperating and support adventure. And uh, uh, we have certainly uh, right at the ship, and um, it's only because of them, not because of me, but because of them working in partnership that we were able to move forward and be successful. The kind words are uh, very, very much appreciated. Um, Trumbull will always, always, and I think I said this when I first came on board, have a special place in my heart. I was here for 39 years as an assistant principal, principal, director of personnel, assistant superintendent, and superintendent for 13 years. And uh, uh, I look back with so very, very many fond memories. And I thank you for your kind words to the whole board and audience. Um, Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Also, I would like to <coughs> make a small announcement. Uh, our first selectman, Vicki Tesoro, has requested to speak. So I told her she could speak during my board report time. So Vicki, if you're on, yes, you are, there you are. You are able to speak, go right ahead. Thank you, Mrs. Timpanelli, and uh, good evening, everybody. Everybody who's on this virtual meeting and the audience that's watching, good evening. Dr. Semmel, nice to see you again. And uh, Mr. Hendrickson, we haven't met yet, but nice to see you as well. Um, so 
just a few comments if I could, and I do appreciate the time. So I'd like to take a moment on behalf of the town of Trumbull to thank Ralph Iasagna for his service to our community. As we all know, the Trumbull public school system is a treasure of our town. Many of the advances and programs that make our system special came under Ralph's leadership. He was and is a tireless defender of our education system. When he retired, he left a system that was the envy of many other communities. This would have been enough for many. Ralph could have continued to enjoy his well-earned retirement. However, when our system was in need, he was there. I cannot thank him enough for doing that for our schools. Think of this, he came on board with a business manager leaving and with a budget in crisis. If that were not enough, the COVID-19 pandemic struck, placing an enormous burden on the system with no precedence on which to rely. His leadership excelled in the most tumultuous of circumstances and all of us owe him a debt of gratitude. On a personal note, I have enjoyed working with Ralph first as a PTA representative and later as an elected official. I will miss his insights and his guidance. The good news for him is that I promise that I will do nothing to disturb his retirement. <laughs> of course, you know what promises made by politicians are worth. <laughs> Thank you, Ralph, from the bottom of my heart. As I said in a recent statement, I want to express my appreciation and gratitude to our teachers, administrators, and support, and support staff as they return to school during these uncertain times. I am confident that no matter the challenge, they will rise to the occasion as they have always done, and I am here to support them. I also want the students and parents to know that I appreciate their cooperation. I visited most of the schools last week, and I will continue to advocate for our teachers, staff, students, and families as I work with the superintendent and the Board of Education during these challenging times. As we all know, this continues to be a very difficult situation. I ask for everyone's patience. Ask questions, be involved, but please give the present plan time to work. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak this evening. Thank you, Mr. Cicero. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very, very much. We go back a long way. I remember when uh, we used to meet on, uh, I think it was Tuesdays, Mondays or Tuesdays uh, with the PTA, uh, and uh, I had very, very fond memories, and I appreciate your support when I did that as uh, the acting superintendent, and uh, uh, I certainly appreciate your kind and gracious uh, uh, comments uh, to me. Uh, as I said, trouble is special. And uh, I will always monitor and cherish those uh, days I spent here, particularly this last time. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Okay, I have on my agenda here a teacher representative report. Uh, Mrs. Rubano is not here this evening. Um, she had a personal issue. So I don't think, is there anyone that's going to read a report from the PTA? I think John Mastriani, TEA president, uh, conveyed to my office, I didn't speak to him personally, that he will uh, carry the report to see you. John, are you on? John Mastriani, are you on? Am I, am I on? Yeah, there you are. Uh, I'm sorry for the lack of video. My, um, whenever I put my video on, it tends to freeze my home screen. So, um, sorry. Um, I wanna say uh, I'm happy this board report is back on the agenda. Uh, with, only, with the only certainty in education these days being uncertainty, it's an important component, it's an important component to help us work through meaningful issues and come to timely solutions. I need to first, commend all of our teachers for their flexibility and professionalism as the school year started today. It was definitely not easy and the stress levels are through the roof, but as usual, Trumbull teachers persevered and made it happen. A CA is also looking forward to meeting Dr. Semmel and working together to bring Trumbull forward through this very uncertain time in public education. As the school, school year starts, there are a couple of lingering issues that I think the and concerns that the, the board and the Long Hill administration should be working with the TEA for. And I need to stress safety first, 
Uh, as of right now, there's a, a lack of PPE for teachers to use in the schools. Masks are in limited supply for now, and cleaning supplies are not in the classrooms. The TA has been told that more supplies are incoming, but have not been given specific dates as to when they will arrive. These supplies in classrooms not only provide a safety net, but they foster a sense of security and safety for students. While it's not required, it's also TEA's position that Trumbull could have provided plexiglass barriers or face shields for their classroom. Offices and buildings that have much less student traffic and exposure to COVID-19 have plastic barriers and would help make teachers feel more secure and increase safety for all if they, added to their, if they were added to classrooms. Surrounding districts, Monroe, Westport, Milford, Reading, Fairfield have all done this. Uh, again, safety is the most, most important thing right now to keep these schools open. Uh, in terms of getting prepared to teach through a pandemic, this was, this was equally as challenging for your teachers. Through no fault of their own, technology integrators um, recently did the, uh, completed the most recent professional development, but it was not robust enough to deal with the tasks that teachers need to accomplish in this new learning model. We received more of an overview of synchronous learning. With, teachers had a lot of questions and not many answers in regards to the new technological aspects of teaching during a pandemic in a hybrid learning model. For example, teachers in grades K-2, uh, they were asked to learn a new platform called, called Seesaw. It was decided late, I believe August 26th or so. If it, be, if it had been decided earlier, teachers could, would have had an option to try out, try it over the summer when there was time. Now they're being asked to learn new software during a time when they're asking to learn so many other things and there's much more important things to worry about. This follows a trend of, of placing these new initiatives on teachers with very little training or time to learn. There were a couple other delays that really hurt some of our classroom teachers before the school year started. Uh, there was a delay with the formation of special schedules at the elementary level. Up until Saturday, they were still deciding, you know, and for a specialist to go, um, uh, still deciding which days and timing especially are going to go into the buildings. This made it really hard for teachers um, of the academics and the elementary levels to, to plan their day without these schedules. I can't stress this enough to anyone listening right now. Across all levels in every school and every grade level, there is still an extremely high level of anxiety due to the lack of communication and clear directives from the district. I like to remind all the parents listening in right now to remember that teachers are learning much of this technology and teaching style as we go forward. Just for example, kindergartners are using Chromebooks for the very first time. These teachers might not even know what their synchronous classroom is going to look like right away. It's going to take time to develop these practices and it can't happen overnight. When you're watching your child's live stream, please keep in mind until we get more comfortable, there's going to be some growing pains. I want to thank all of our TA members. Um, through this, out the summer, they were, they were fantastic. You know, we sent out two surveys, they completed them in a timely manner, and they did so in large numbers. That, that's, that's a good thing. You know, that gives us the, the numbers that we need to advocate properly, and we can have meaningful discussions like we've been having. Uh, and I need to clarify this, this last thing, because it's been under my skin for the past, like, two weeks. I'm sorry. Uh, it's a TEA's position that we were not the ones responsible for communicating the reopening plan to teachers, as suggested. In fact, if I did communicate the reopening plan that was suggested at the last Board of Ed meeting, I would have had to rescind my communication because the plan was changed behind closed doors once it left subcommittee. You know, and that's, it would, make, it would, it would have make it, made it very awkward for me to have to bring that back. So on that note, um, thank you for bringing us the report back. I think it's important that we have these dialogues. We're, we're trying to do the right thing for the kids of this town, and it's important to talk to do that. So thank you. Thank you. Excuse me, Mr. Mike. Can I just say a brief response? Okay. We have had many conversations with John Wright, respect, uh, particularly as his uh, position as TEA president, okay, uh, and with uh, Herman uh, Jones and uh, one of the other affiliates from uh, the TA on several occasions. And uh, unfortunately, I think some of the things that John alluded to were not here. Very inaccurate, okay? Uh, particularly, I know Jonathan has spent an inordinate amount of time. He was instrumental in developing a lot of plans that um, came forward that we initiated Friday, today, and will continue. I always said that this 
our plan is a work in progress. It will evolve and we will change it when necessary. Okay? And if it's necessary, we will change it. But some of the things that uh, he alluded to, I don't think were fair in regard to what has actually transpired. Okay? And I think that, that that's unfortunate because, and I will say this when we get on to the superintendent's uh, opening of school report, uh, things went extremely well considering the pandemic, the racial strife, all the other things that we um, that you had mentioned in your uh, litany before. And uh, it's unfortunate that uh, uh, I don't want parents to get the idea that we're in disarray. We certainly are not. We are ready to move forward. And we hope that John and his executive board, who we know has been quite open with it, and move forward together in a partnership where we can really uh, make it a meaningful learning experience for all of our students and staff for 2020 and 21. Okay, thank you. And for any other comments, we'll take it up when we get to report 3C, okay? Lucinda? Okay, Lucinda? as we move on. Um, Lucinda? People of the minute. Lucinda. But, hey, Lucinda, this is Andy. I'm sorry. Mr. Oh, Mr. Pale, I didn't hear you, Andy. I'm sorry. Um, can I, before we move on, can I ask Ralph a question about something he covered in his opening remarks? In his opening remarks? Does it have to, does it have to do with the school reopening plan? Um, it had, he was talking about the school lunches and that the state of Connecticut was going to cover the school lunches. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I just was going to ask him if he can explain that a little bit further, how that works. Uh, Andy, it's a good question. It works uh, very similar to what transpired during the summer, where that parents of students in the Trumbull Public Schools can come one location, Trumbull High School, and can pick up uh, breakfast and lunches together for their children. Okay, um, it just came, and we don't know specifically the exact details, only because it just came across the wires on Friday evening. And Mrs. Simco sent out a um, um, flyer today on it, and we'll send out other things to let everybody know. But the bottom line is any student who goes to the Trumbull Public Schools is entitled to a free lunch, paid, hopefully, to be paid for by the state of Connecticut every day we are in session. And it will be distributed um, in the flyer at the, at the local school. Interesting. Andy? Yeah, and this is uh, John, who just reminded me, um, Mrs. Simco and Lori Silver, who are assistant, sent an e blast to all the parents today with regard to that and talked about each day Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and also on Wednesdays, it's available. But it's uh, amplified in the e blast. But if there are any further questions, parents can call. Um, uh, Mrs. Simcoe's office, food service at Long Hill School. Ralph, it's Sarah, breakfast. It's yes, breakfast and lunch. Jackie or Sal, go ahead. Yeah, we, Ralph said lunch. It's breakfast and lunch. They can get yes. both. Breakfast and lunch, just like in the summer. Yes. And, and uh, how Sarah. we did last March. Thank you, Jackie. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add, I, I have a little bit of knowledge of this um, from my job. What what I believe the it is, it's, it's normally a federal program that covers school, uh, covers meals for families during the summer period. And what happened is back in the spring, they extended it. They essentially started it early to cover families during the COVID closures. And then the decision that was made last week is that they will extend it through the, the fall and uh, up until December 31st, I think. So it's essentially a program, an existing program that covers lunches during the summer that the federal government has expanded on either end. Thank you. Okay, if we have any other questions on the lunch program, we'll put it on the agenda next time around so that can we, have, we can have an update and have a discussion. I'm sure Betty would be happy to join the board and share Our only concern, her major concern, you know promises made by Special companies sometimes don't come to fruition. Uh, this is a very expensive venture. Uh, providing breakfast and lunch for 
for all students. I mean, just think about it. We have 7,000 students. Okay. Well, like I said, we'll put it on as an agenda item and then someone can give us an update at the next meeting. Okay, the next one uh, is approval of the minutes, the regular meeting of 8 25 2020. So I'll make a motion. Of the regular meeting from 8 25 2020. I need a second. A second, that second Jackie. Second from uh, Mr. Ward. Any mm -hmm. questions on that? Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, Scott, I just. Um, Question. I communicated with Elaine before the meeting. I just would like the record to um, show that John Morello was present and answered questions and provided information during the um, during the uh, the school reopening plan section. Okay, Elaine, do you have that? Yes, we'll add that. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I will take the vote. Okay, Mr. Gallo. Um, I'm in favor. Okay, Mrs. Tempanelli in favor. Mrs. Petiti. In favor. Mr. Ward. Yes, in favor. Uh, Mr. Kerr. Yes, in favor. Mrs. Marcel. Yes, in favor. And Mr. Palo. In favor. Thank you. Okay, our next. Uh, I need a motion for the next. Okay, so I'm going to make a motion to um, for to amend. Um, so I'm making the motion for the amended minutes of January 6, 2020. I need a second. I second. Okay. Any questions? Okay. And we'll take the vote. Mr. Gallo? I'm in favor. Lucinda Timpanelli in favor. Mrs. Petiti? In favor. Mr. Ward? Yes, in favor. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Kerr? Yes, in favor. Mrs. Norcell? Yes, in favor. Okay, and, and Mr. Palo, we're going to abstain because you weren't there, okay? Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving on. Personnel, Mr. Isagna. Um, okay, the board is asked to approve two resolutions of uh, some of staff members. Uh, I would certainly appreciate all your efforts. Okay, I make a motion to accept the um, retiring of the following two employees. So, Diana Kiara who was a technology integration specialist at Hillcrest Middle School since August 2014. She would be retiring effective January 5th, 2021. And Kirk Schultz, social studies teacher at Trumbull High School since November 2004, retiring effective November 2nd, 2020. I need a second. I'll second that, Lucinda Jackie. I'll second. Uh, would anyone like to say a few words about any one of these people that they may know? Dr. Bud? Yes, I do want to say a few words about both Ms. Gara and Mr. Schultz. Uh, Ms. Gara was here in front of the board just last year, and you might remember that she was instrumental in leading the digital citizenship efforts in her role as a technology integrator at Hillcrest Middle School, and she has really promoted that. We wish her all the best in her retirement, very well deserved. And the same is true, that last comment for Mr. Schultz. Uh, Mr. Schultz is a leader in the social studies department. He is not only a great team player, but he teaches a range of social studies classes, including our AP economics course, one of the main teachers of that course. And uh, he came into teaching as a second career, and he did that after a career in law enforcement, so he expanded his skills in helping others by bringing that into the classroom. So both Ms. Gara and Mr. Schultz will be deeply missed by the Trumbull Public Schools. Thank you. Okay, and I would like to say something about Mr. Schultz. I work with Mr. Schultz at Trumbull High School. He is a kind and intelligent man and a gentleman. And it, it, it's a sin that we won't be seeing him anymore because he was wonderful. The kids loved him. He did a great job teaching AP Econ. So I wish him all the best, and may your retirement be a very, very happy, healthy one. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to take the vote. Um, Mr. Gallo. I am in favor. I'm, okay, next one, Lucinda Tempanelli in favor. Maurice Keating. In favor. Michael Ward. Yes, in favor. Uh, and Scott Pierre. Yes, in favor. Jackie Marcel. Yes, in favor. Andy Palo. In favor. Thank you, that's unanimous, thank you. Okay, our next report is the school reopening plan, Mr. Isagna. Thank you. Uh, I commented briefly on uh, some aspects of this and uh, I'll try to keep this concise. 
since the end of the 2019-20 uh, school year, uh, the district has been preparing for a reopening plan. Given the immediate challenges, particularly with the COVID-19 and uh, pandemic and um, social and racial strife across the country, the board and community should be immensely proud of the perseverance and commitment of its staff. A successful reopening was no easy or sure task, but with everyone working together, certified and non-certified, I want to emphasize that, certified and non-certified, we accomplished much in a very short time. You know, June 30th, we had July and August, and we started in September. That's a, a quick turnaround. And uh, every department excelled, particularly our facilities department, who had the PPEs in place. We have a sufficient number of PPEs. They're not in each school, but there are sufficient numbers in each school. But we have, at the storage lockers, the rest of the backup that we can disseminate quickly. John Morell has done a phenomenal, phenomenal job with regard to that. Uh, and although we may not have everything that other districts have, they don't have what we have. Okay, you can't compare districts. Uh, the previous speaker mentioned about the plexiglass. Well, we have some plexiglass where teachers want to then at the end of their desk so they can meet one on one with students. Not every class has plexiglass. Teachers didn't want them at that time. Some districts have them, but other districts don't have the extra custodial staff for sanitation, sanitization that we do. So, you know, we've met all the requirements, all the health and wellness requirements, especially. The parents should really know that we're all set with regard to that based on the input from Lucy Bongo, health director, Lynn Steinberg, uh, who's the uh, nursing supervisor, and Megan, who's the, uh, um, sorry, um, uh, EMS. Okay, fire marshal, but EMS. Okay, uh, they we work very closely with them. We appreciate all of their help. I can pick up the phone anytime, whether here or home, no matter what time, you get any of those, and they will respond and help us out immensely. And to that, we are truly appreciative uh, of that. Okay, um, with regard to today's opening, went relatively very, very well. There were, you know, there's always going to be glitches normal glitches. We had a couple buses that may have been overcrowded. Dawn is still here working on that and we'll be on two buses tomorrow. I think we're on this middle book uh, and you know Booth Hill and is checking on that. So you know we follow up whenever we hear things. Some of the things that John mentioned, um, Mastriani, uh, we will follow up on. Okay. It just doesn't go in one ear and not the other. And uh, we're going to check on what uh, Michael Barker uh, mentioned to us with regard to the temporary remote learning. Uh, but it was quite successful. Food service uh, and technology uh, went well, okay. Uh, a superintendent's worst scenario is when you wake up and you're going to work at seven o'clock in the morning, you get a phone call, French Town's power is out. And that's what happened this morning. They have no phone, they have no Wi-Fi. Well, what happened? Jeff Hackett sent two of his technicians directly there, and within a half hour, we found what was the problem with the car. It just burnt out, and uh, we're ready to go. So, you know, really, when you, when you look at the total picture, Trumbull is very fortunate to have the people working for him that, they, that we did. Um, I want to emphasize this again. Our plan, the hybrid plan, could change tomorrow. Okay. That depends on the governor, the state, the commissioner of education, etc. But please know that it will change no matter what they do, because there are certain things that we learn throughout any plan. There were two communities that I put this in the email. They were all set to open, and they couldn't open for a variety of legitimate reasons. Through no fault of anybody, okay, they had to not only postpone opening the school, but they also had to um, uh, give uh, 
change from a hybrid to a remote learning. Those things happen when you're facing challenges like a pandemic. Just look at across the country. And it's not, you know, somebody wrote a letter and said, oh, we don't have uh, enough teachers. Do you know that all certified positions have been filled except two, which is phenomenal. During a regular school year, we have more. That's because of personnel, HR. They've done a great, phenomenal job. Mary Connect me, Joanne Borkowski. And every position head has done that. And it's because of those people that we're in a good stead right now. But we're going to adapt to changes as they come up. And we're always going to do that. And Marty, uh, Dr. Semmel, and I have talked about that. We've transitionalized. We've done a spoke at length. He's well aware of it. Topics, and I think that he will be an asset to the district. Okay. Okay, what I'd like to know if anyone has a question on the reopening plan, now is the time to ask it. Anyone wants to know anything about anything that Ralph can answer? No? Sure? Okay. I have a, yeah, That's I guess I, I could ask a question. I'm, I was um, curious about what the, what the, um, overall decision or guidance is to the schools regarding after, you know, after school activities that aren't sports, um, clubs and, and that kind of thing. Uh, as you know, the sports uh, have been canceled for the fall season. Um, the last two were football, which is definitely, uh, have been deleted from the program. Uh, volleyball, as long as the uh, participants wear masks when playing. Um, Schools are open until six, uh, elementary schools are open until 6 p.m. Activities can not take place then. After six o'clock, they will be shifted to the two middle schools and the high school. We have extra custodial help and um, we can handle that. But um, as far as which clubs, uh, that, you know, uh, like the chess club or the, uh, whatever, um, these principals, are deciding that as we speak to find out the interest level. Uh, if you only have three or four students want to be involved in the chess club, that probably will not run. Okay, but if you have 15, it's going to run, and they're going to make that decision themselves. That's a school-based decision because they know their their students and the enrollment numbers. Well, I, I would just ask Ralph that what that going forward as those things get communicated that we're clear or the schools and principals are clear with people about whether those whether those reductions are resulting from the budget cuts if you recall you know during the budget season we made hard decisions and there were things said about us having to potentially cancel smaller clubs um and then there is, of course, the, you know, the COVID uh, closures and such that might be impacting it. So I would just ask that we be as, as, um, as clear with people as possible about which, which of those circumstances is causing a club to not be offered. Yeah, Scott, your point's well taken. I would say off the top of my head right now, uh, it's mainly because of not only COVID, but also cleaning, okay, cleaning the buildings. It's partly, though, it's a uh, budgetary thing, but mainly it's the COVID slash cleaning of the buildings to make sure that they are uh, all set for the students when they return the next day. Ralph, can I just ask, you talked all about school-based activities. At the PTA meeting today, they talked about having enrichment after school. Is that allowed? Uh, will we keep the cohort? Jackie is allowed up until 6 p.m. after which if they have a, let's say a bingo night, that would have to be the two middle schools and the high school or the high school. And they would- All right, so if it's after school, if it's, if it's after school, will they keep the cohorts separated? You know, they usually do something after school. Uh, Jackie, can you repeat that? You didn't hear you. Jackie, please repeat that. Would they keep the cohorts still separate? Let me repeat it. Repeat that, please. Yeah, after school, if the PTA have, you know, running or painting, will they keep the cohort separate? Or will it be like it used to be after school, you know, Tuesday, anybody come? You know, I, I think it would be like it used to be, but I will double check, Jonathan, you know that? Because 
what happens is you're not going to get a full complement of students wanting, let's say I use chess club. But if you keep goal art, you may only have two from each goal. Whereas if you combine them, you have six. So uh, that, that's a good question. We'll follow through on it. Yeah, that was my, my understanding. The question that came up the, this morning was that they, um, the, the PTSA president had a had an email from you, Ralph, I think that said that that no PTA activities could happen after school. And that we, they, the question was, does that include enrichment? And people assumed that it was, you were saying no, because we couldn't have people from cohort B coming into the building on cohort A day, right? So if, if they need to change their enrichment so that it is you know, split up into the same cohorts as the instruction, then we just need to tell them that. Right. Yeah, well, Scott, uh, we'll follow through on it, but I don't remember mentioning anything in an email about cohorts. In fact, I whispered to Dave when you mentioned it about the cohort, what, what does uh, Scott mean by cohorts? But uh, we'll check with the principals tomorrow. Uh, but, we, you know, last week we had a meeting and we uh, disseminated this information like I just did. But again, we will follow through on that promise. Okay. Yeah, uh, Ralph, also just follow through because TLC was under the impression that they could not mix the cohorts. And, and well, that would be a decision, Jackie. And I'll check with Ken McCabe. We talk uh, once every week or two. Um, that would be a decision he would have to make um, uh, because that's one of the reasons why we went to six because that's when he closes up. But we'll, we'll make sure we touch bases with Ken. Right. Thank you. I, I have just one, one more thing to add, and I think that Jonathan is actually going to cover this when, when Dr. Butt comes up and speaks, but it's a little bit about the 10 to 11% of the remote learners. And, um, you know, I know that there has been some changes made to what we originally thought that, that to how that 10% would be um, addressed. So I'm looking forward to hearing some of that, and I know that Jonathan, you said that you might illuminate a little bit of that when, when you did this next piece. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave that for you. Anyone else with a question? No? Okay. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next report, which is the 2020-2021 planning update student enrollment, Dr. Bud. Thank you, and Ms. Marina has a presentation to present to the, uh, to the public. So I'll just wait till that comes up. Board members have a hard copy of it. Projected at this point. Uh, Mr. Kirk, could you confirm that? Yes, it's up. Yes. Thank you. So um, I would want to say first that this enrollment report represents the really strong work of the board in helping to support the district over the past uh, two months when we've given the uh, regular updates. Uh, we have made really good decisions at the K 5 level first about staffing of classrooms as we saw the trends move. So I will just briefly highlight each school, but I have included on this presentation the average class size uh, based on the enrolled students. These are today's numbers and the scheduled sections. Uh, so Booth Hill is sitting today with 489 students, uh, over 25 sections. And you see the average class size is there. Daniels Farr, which has our largest enrollment at the moment, is 523 students spread over 26 classes. Frenchtown is at 512 students, the second largest of our elementary schools. They're spread over 26 classes. And you might remember that two weeks ago, Ralph and I mentioned to you that grade four 
uh, might trip over into another section, which it did shortly after that meeting. So they have four sections there and they have 26 sections total. Jane Ryan had 405 students, has 22 sections. Middlebrook, our third largest school, is at 509 students spread across 26 sections. And Tashua, 403 students spread over 20 students. So if you look at the entire K-5 summer enrollment report, you'll see that we have a little over 2,800 students in K-5 sitting today, uh, over 145 sections. That's an increase of three sections from the number that we had last school year. And you see the average class sizes uh, across the district there, um, which I will say, speaking comparatively to other districts, uh, position Trumbull very competitively as far as our elementary class size. As a note to the board, since the August 25th meeting, we did add that one additional grade four French town class. And as promised, we had to increase, we did increase uh, uh, specialist uh, assignments in art, music, and physical education K-5. The largest one there in art uh, was assigned to Tech Ed. And we talked about that in the budget process and that related to an overall uh, increase in instructional minutes from 45 to 60 minutes in uh, K-5 art classes. If you then, you then will see the uh, official, uh, although small, uh, detail there. I would just say that uh, there are some influx and outflux of these classes over the first few days of school because we sometimes have students who are on this roster who do not report for one reason or another and we follow up. And we also have students in the enrollment process. We actually still have at the K-5 level in the enrollment process 39 students. And so if you look at the K-5 summary year to year, you'll see that today as compared to the last day of school in June, we're just down 38 students. But I totally expect when you see the official state numbers that are used based on the October 1st enrollment, that we will meet uh, the standard of where we were last year. Then uh, we have the slide on the secondary enrollment, grades six to 12. Uh, as we predicted, the largest increase there is at Trumbull High School, which is up 42 students from where we ended last year. The middle schools have a slight decrease because of uh, a large eighth grade that exited. Uh, we have 70 fewer students right now secondary uh, but you will see the updated numbers at the first October board meeting, and uh, we do see some moves in here as well. So the total K-12 summary year to year uh, is reflected on the next slide. Uh, we are just short 118 of where we left last year, and we typically present you a final enrollment update at the first October board meeting, and that's what the state uses for its figures from the October 1st count. And then uh, speaking both to the comment by Mr. Barker in public comment and also to Mr. Gallo's comment, the last slide you'll see is a summary of where we are for students in temporary remote learning. So these are students whose parents have chosen that they will learn at home all five days. So the concept is uh, a typical student in the hybrid phase is in school two days and learning from home all uh, the other three. Students in temporary remote learning are learning from home all five, but they're part of the classroom count. They're included in the numbers that you just saw for every classroom, and they, they are, if you will, dialing into the classroom on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, just like the 50% of students who are home on either pair of those days. So as we uh, work to have the best schedules, clearly communicate them to the 50% of students who are at home on those days. Uh, the same is communicated to the temporary remote learners uh, because I would say in essence, the general reason most parents have decided to keep their students home all five days is based on their own health and safety concerns, perhaps uh, through family members that live in the household that they may not want their students going out to an environment and, uh, and bringing things back into the home. You see the percentage numbers here. Uh, I would predict by the end of this week, this uh, will probably be closer to 15%. Uh, 
we actually have some students who did not report today and others who will not report Thursday whose parents are choosing this option but haven't officially notified us yet. We find that out through the attendance tracking process. You will see it is a little bit lower at grades 9 to 12, but still over 10% there. So in, in the end, it actually ends up being rather consistent with the early survey we did of parents that suggested about 15% of them might keep their children home. We want these students to get the same strong education as if they were in the building and their schedules <coughs> reflect the same courses and the same teacher assignments that they would have if they were in the school. Uh, not Dr. Blood, that, that's a change from what our original plan was, right? And our original plan was to kind of have a little separate cohort for that group. And they were going to be educated by um, staff members who are also uh, on remote learning, right? But um, can you maybe illuminate us a little bit on that and explain, you know, why we, why we made the change? Well, as these numbers, which started to come in, I want to say the earliest were the first couple of days of August, but as the numbers grew over the course of August, uh, and many of our staff members who had originally requested to work from home would be able to be offered accommodations in the workplace so that they wouldn't be working from home. We had an increasing number of these students and a decreasing number of teachers who were going to work from home. In addition, we had to look at the certification areas of those teachers, and they did not match the uh, profile of the students. So it became not only logistically the only thing to do, uh, but also it matched what many parents were asking for for temporary remote learners that, uh, let's say, at the elementary school context, that they'd be able to participate with the same second grade teacher that they would have had. Because ultimately, the goal is, we can't predict a pandemic, but that we'll all be back at some point, and these students will be back in that second grade class. So for both the logistical reasons, as well as responding to where parents were talking about, um, we knew we had to make some changes. Uh, we were in a few weeks ago, over 150 requests for this per day, and uh, the number of teachers we had working remotely didn't keep pace. Finally, I would just add, there was not going to be any feasible way for the district to hire 30 or 40 more teachers to teach these students. A uh, neighboring community near us um, made a different choice and decided to um, reassign a couple of days before school started. Um, all students and teachers removed the temporary remote learners from the class rosters and remove existing teachers from classrooms and reassign them for temporary remote learning. Um, the response in that district predictably was very uh, uh, negative in terms of the chaos that that caused to staff and students, and we didn't want to go that way. Well, I'm encouraged to hear that we, we've gone in this direction. And, um, you know, as many of you know, I'm a, I'm a fifth grade teacher, and I'm, I'm deep in the trenches right now. I'm teaching, teaching hybrid um, myself. And uh, we, have a, we have a few re remote learners that are, that are assigned to my class, too. And I, I just think it's um, just much better for the kids. It makes them feel part of the community. And uh, some of those kids are your are your best helpers on the, on the computer too. So um, again, encouraging that we've, we've been able to move into that model and hopefully it'll just improve and, you know, as, we, as we keep going. I would just point out that uh, another asset of those students is they are the glue between cohort A and cohort B because they're participating remotely all those days and kind of keep that current going. Dr. Bunn, I have a question. So we'll look at this district-wide and reevaluate everything in a couple of weeks. When, when do you plan on doing that? Looking at it in two weeks, three weeks? I would anticipate from the emails we've received today that you're going to see um, two things happen, and actually they even each other out if today's numbers are accurate. You're going to have, as I said, some students who parents opt for temporary remote learning just today or tomorrow. But we also have parents who emailed last night or this morning and said, actually, I thought I'd keep my child home all five days, but they want to go, and I feel confident in the district. So today, we've been removing as many students from temporary remote learning as we've been adding them. However, I want to say that sensitive to parents and families' health and safety concerns, someone can opt into temporary remote learning at any time. The state just today 
We have an exceptionally lengthy document about tracking attendance for different types of learners, and we'll be implementing that over the next few days as well. But we'll have an update for the board, I would think, at the next September meeting uh, to show you where the numbers are then. Okay, thank you. Well, right, does anyone else have yeah. yeah, Madam Chair? Yeah. Oh, sorry, Scott, I saw you with your hand up. You want to go okay. first? You go sure? first. Okay, thank you. Um, since the uh, since the budget was set, um, and now that these numbers have flushed out and and and, and are and are somewhat accurate, how many positions, how many teacher positions have been added uh, since that point in time, since the budget was set? Well, how many teacher positions have been added? I prefer to give a more. I prefer to give the more exact answer, Mr. Palo, at the next meeting, because it, it, it is complicated in this sense that we have had to add a number of long-term substitute positions to um, compensate in the classroom for teachers, both who are working from home and who have taken FMLA leave. So it's not a precise number I'm able to give tonight. I can tell you that the number of certified teachers we have hired over the past, uh, well, over the summer is over 40. But many of those are going into positions that have been left unpaid uh, while somebody is absent from them. So if we could get you that information at the next meeting, I'd be more comfortable with that. Great, thank you very much. That's great, thanks. I, I think 42 is the number that sticks with me, but we, we want to be accurate and we'll get back to you on that end. Yeah. yeah, first of all, just to follow up on Andy's question, I just want to say I think what he's getting at is over the last several meetings we've we've where we've increased the number of sections and we've had to add teachers. This goes back to the question I asked a few weeks ago about can can we look at that relative to what was budgeted, right? It's just basically knowing where where we are relative to the budget that we approved. That's what I think we're getting at. Yes, and, and what, what we've been able to say, and I think what I suspect you're wanting even more specificity on is that uh, the budget for many of these positions that have been added was in reserve for negotiations. And with Mr. Cameron back this week, we'll be able to drill down into that and give you more specificity about it. Yeah, excellent. The other the instructional question that I... Oh. I'm sorry. Scott, go ahead. They're talking at the same time, so say what you want to say. I, I just wanted to ask um, Jonathan, could you could you paint just a little picture of what kind of um, what kind of supports the teachers might be getting around managing the two groups, right? The in-class group and the uh, at-home group. Like, how, how does that coordination, like some of the disconnect that Mr. Barker described, like what are we what are we putting in place to try to prevent that? Well, I was. In rooms today, I'll speak at the elementary level since that was the level that was focused on. I was in classrooms at Jane Ryan and at Daniel's Farm, and you see, uh, parents, you see teachers implementing techniques, for example, like sending schedules to parents ahead of time, but not just a day ahead of time, but a few days ahead of time. Uh, today, in any elementary school classroom, not just in COVID, but for years, will be procedural, will be some things about getting students oriented into the school building. And so principals have been using time with teachers to say, what will this week look like as far as getting students oriented both in the building and also at home? And then how can we provide a schedule to parents in advance of next week that really will be able to incorporate all of the areas. So in terms of support, we have principals who have for the past six days of professional development been meeting with their staffs daily. And we also have uh, our program leaders in literacy, math, and science helping to support those in areas of instruction uh, and having the two paths always of what is going to be done for students in school and then at what times will you bring the distance learners in and at what times will you have them do work offline? But you're going to see a development in this, uh, both elementary and secondary, over the course of time. We, we want to walk well before we start to run. And we want every classroom teacher uh, walking capably, if you will, uh, before we have the system running with, with everything at full speed. 
And that's, that's not an excuse to say that it will not be as strong as it can be. But in heading elementary school on the first few days, you're going to see some organizational things happening. Great, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else with a question? Can um, I just add something? Yeah. Um, the reason why um, Jonathan mentioned about the reserve for negotiations, and Alice here can extend it if he wants to, but remember the 39 unbudgeted Harris? Okay, we could not hire them back. And that money we put into the reserve, okay, and that's what we're going to dip into for additional teachers. Okay. Anyone else with questions? Nice report. Okay. Uh, Thank you for the report, Mr. Mr. Ward. Oh, very nice. Your heads up. I'll make the motion. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Mr. Ward, I make the formal motion. On behalf of Mr. Ralph I signed up the meeting is should be adjourned. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Ward. Second, Mr. Okay. Petiti. Okay. I guess everyone's in favor. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you all for participating. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, Ralph. Congratulations. Thanks, Ralph. Thank you.